Thanks, everybody. Thank you. So I'd imagine most of you in the audience tonight must think it's really cool to be a race car driver. <laughs> yeah, it is. It's awesome. <laughs> With that, there are also a lot of unique challenges and significant obstacles that all of us have to overcome. It's been my passion and my dream since I was 13 years old to become a professional race car driver. Tonight, I'm here to tell you the story, my story. There's a few million race car drivers all across the world. Less than 1,000 of them make it to a professional racing car driver status. Even less than that, make it their career for their life. My career started when I was 13 years old. I started in go-karts and quickly progressed to the state level, to the national level, and to the world final level. From there, I went to Skip Barber, an open wheel formula car, and then progressed to sports car ladder system. My story tonight starts in 2010. As a 19-year-old kid racing in the biggest race in the US sports car scene, the Rolex at Daytona 24 hour. A team took a chance on me as a young, unproven kid and put me into their car in the premier class of our biggest race. The race that attracts hundreds of drivers from across the world, the best of the best, come to Daytona to try and win this race and win a special, unique Daytona Rolex watch. 19 hours into the race, we were primed for a possible top five position. I was in the car, leaving pit lane. I was excited, ready to go, and try to challenge and get us up into a podium result. And then this happened. Big incident as we welcome you back to Daytona between Bryce Miller and Dion Von Moltke. One GT car and one heavily damaged Daytona prototype. Obviously, we'll have a full course yellow because that hit the end of the barrier. It's not going to go anywhere. This is turn one, extremely high speed corner. Wow, that is huge, and uh, we have no idea what happened. Obviously, the two cars involved, maybe someone else is near the pit out, too. So, hopefully, no one came across there. But let's take a look. And yes, and it is. Oh, no. Oh, oh look, oh, too no. much this speed. Is... We've talked about this corner. Look at this. Oh, I, I was just looking at that, and it's right before the wall starts. And we talked about that was me in the white car leaving pit lane cold tires, and hitting the wall at close on 80 miles an hour. It cost hundreds of thousands of dollars of damage. The car was finished. We were done, out of the race. After that, I had to go back to the pits, look my teammates in the eye, and apologize to them. I had to go and see our crew members, who had been up for over 30 hours, giving their heart and soul, working tirelessly through the night to try and win this race and apologize to them. I had to go to my team owner, who had taken a chance on a young 19-year-old kid, and apologize to him. Needless to say, after that, the team didn't want me back. Even though I was bringing money to the team to race, they didn't want me back in the car. A year later, I was racing for one of the premier teams in GT sports car racing, the Racers Group. One of my first times given the opportunity to drive in one of the top tier level teams. The second race of the season was at the Long Beach Grand Prix. At this point in my career in the GT class, I had no podiums, no wins, Nothing to really stake my name on to say, hey, I'm here and I can do this. With less than 10 minutes to go at the Long Beach Grand Prix, I was battling for a podium position in third place. With about five minutes to go, trying to defend that position, I came together with a competitor and he sent me into the wall hard. 
Once again, we were out of the race. Car was badly damaged. The next day, we flew back to Miami with my parents, and we all live here. And I remember sitting in my room, and I got a text that I know a lot of you in the audience can relate to when they were teenagers, the text that makes all of our hearts drop from my dad. We need to talk. <laughs> yeah. I rolled my eyes a bit and got up and walked to the other side of the house and sat down. And my dad has been my biggest supporter by far. Been with me at every moment of my career, every turn, pushing me to get better, supported me emotionally and financially. And that day he asked me a question. He said, Dion, do you think you're good enough? Do you think you can really make it in this business? That just shook me to the core. To have my biggest supporter question if I was good enough changed something in me. To me, the answer was easy. Yeah, I, of course I am. I know I'm good enough. So, after that, we had a month break until the next race of the season at the Lime Rock Park in Connecticut. And we flew back to South Africa, where my family is from. And we have a uh, property on a game reserve park, nature reserve, where there's no dangerous animal, just things like giraffe and zebra and buck and stuff like that. So you can go outside and walk around and be a part of nature. After that talk with my dad, something had changed in me. I went from, I went from wanting it to needing it to happen. In South Africa, I didn't have some of the facilities that I had here to go and try to get better. But I was gonna do everything I could to get better. I went to the nearest tree limb and I was doing pull-ups on that tree limb. I got the closest heavy rock and used that to make my ab exercises more difficult. And let me take a step back and explain why. As a race car driver, I get asked more than anything else, why do you work out? You just sit there and turn the wheel. The race car is a violent environment. It gets to over 150 degrees Fahrenheit inside the car. You can pull as much as three to four G-forces, which means your head, your neck, your shoulders can weigh three or four times what they usually weigh. The steering wheel can feel like you're holding 20-pound weights in each hand. You can also be in this environment for three hours at a time and not have much break and have to go back in for another three hours. It's also extremely difficult mentally. You're battling for minute amounts of time. If you are just one mile an hour off at a given corner, it equates to about a tenth of a second. If I take our most recent racetrack race at Road Atlanta with 13 corners, if you are one mile an hour off of the best car at every single corner, you're gonna be off about 1.3 seconds. That's the difference from first to last. If all of you in the audience tonight had a stopwatch, a little simple one, and I asked you just to start it and stop it as fast as you could, I guarantee you'll be about a hundredth of a second. That could be the difference from first to fifth. The difference from a team owner being impressed by you and hiring you, or no one even knowing your name. In the midst of all of that, it might be 2 a.m., you've had no sleep, it's the 24 hour, the biggest race of your season. You're cold, you have to be thrown into the car, you're flipping switches, it's nighttime, you're battling for position, faster cars are overtaking you, you're overtaking slower cars. You can imagine the environment is extremely stressful, not only physically, but mentally. So I have to make a few other changes in my life at this time. I was young, new to college, in a fraternity and having a lot of fun. I changed my priorities then, and I knew if I needed this and I wanted this to happen, I had to take a step back from a lot of my friends, sacrificing a lot of fun times to go spend those times having two-a-days in the gym for over a year. I also made 
probably the toughest decision that I've had to make, especially for, at the time, a 20-year-old guy. Decided to stop flirting with girls. <laughs> that was tough. That was really tough. But it was something I needed to do. So we got back to the US, and I flew up to Connecticut for the next race. Lime Rock Park was a track that I hadn't had much success at in the past, but that day, I came from more than one lap down, past the entire field, and past my more experienced, and frankly at the time, better teammate on the last corner of the last lap to win the race. My first big professional win. That day, I knew the answer was yes, that I could make it. I just had to keep going with the changes I had made, and it was going to happen. The off-season for a driver is a stressful, stressful time. It's a mercenary-style environment. There's very few seats or rides available, and we're all fighting with one another to try and get those few seats. Everyone against everyone, and very rarely do you ever have more than a one-year contract. For us, every year is a contract year. So going into the 2013 season was the first time in my career that I had no full season contract. I was contracted to two races and two races only. The Rolex at Daytona 24 hour, the biggest race of our season, and the Sebring 12 hour, the second biggest race of our season. I also had the biggest opportunity in my career. It's pretty much the dream of every sports car driver to become a driver for a manufacturer. I was driving for a car backed by a manufacturer at Daytona for the first time. During the off season, not knowing what I would do after those two races, it was, could have been very stressful. But I did the only thing I knew that I could do. I went to work. And I focused on the only thing I could control. And that was when I showed up in that car in Daytona, I was going to be the best driver I could be. They told us, if we win the race, don't worry, a full season contract will come. So I went to work. We showed up in Daytona, and we had a really strong package, a really strong car. Everyone was on, in sync. I found myself 23 hours, 58 minutes, and a few seconds into the race, arm in arm with two of my teammates, watching our other teammate drive on the last lap. And this is what it looked like. And there is your winner in GT. We won the race. There was over 35 cars, over 150 drivers in our class alone, the best from around the world. And we won the Rolex watch that day. After a week, no full season contract came, no phone calls, no interest at all from other teams. After the second week, I got a call from our team owner, Alex Job, and he said, you know, the sponsor for our next race at Sebring doesn't want you in the car anymore, wants somebody else. The best I could do was organize a shootout. Two weeks before the race, we're going to have both of you come, and you're going to compete head-to-head, -head, back to back. We're going to take the best single lap, and a 10-lap average, and the best driver is going to earn his way into the car. Once again, more uncertainty. But I did the only thing I knew that I could do, and I just went to work. So when I showed up to that test, I was going to be better than anybody else there. I showed up, I beat the other driver in the one-lap average, 
and I beat him on the 10 lap average and earned my way back into the car. Two weeks later, we went on and won the Sebring 12 hour. My second win at Sebring in a row. Another week went by after the win. No phone calls, no full season contracts. A month went by, nothing. Finally, two weeks before the next race of the season at the Long Beach Grand Prix, a team I grew up rooting for, a team I grew up watched win championships year after year, win races year after year, called me and they had an empty seat available and they wanted me to drive their car for the rest of the year, Flying Lizard Motorsports. I'd be driving with the team owner, Seth Nyman. My first race with the team was back at Long Beach Grand Prix, where I'd crashed out two years earlier. Once again, with less than 10 minutes to go, I found myself battling for a podium position with a very good competitor following me closely behind. This time, I was different. My priorities had changed, and I needed this to happen. This time, I held him off, and I scored that podium position in my first race with the team. Later in the season, at the Baltimore Grand Prix, I earned my teammate his first win after nine years in the American Le Mans series. The team awarded me with my first fully paid professional race car driver contract going into the 2014 season of the Tudor Championship. Finally achieved it, finally happened. So I stand in front of you today, after the season, in that mercenary style environment that I talked about earlier. I don't know what I'll be doing next year. I don't know if or where I'll be driving, but I can promise you one thing, I'm working, so wherever I end up, I'll be the best that I can be. I said earlier in the speech that when I started, it was my passion and my dream to become a professional racing car driver. I can stand in front of you tonight and say, it is my passion and my dream to remain a professional racing car driver. And I've got the confidence through all that I've been through that no obstacle, no challenge is going to stop me from continuing my dream. Thank you, everyone. I appreciate your time. I'm Dion Vamolka.